<laughs> well, folks, we'll, we'll uh, begin our time of worship, returning to the words of Psalm 95. The call to worship's here. Will come and let us to the Lord in songs our voices raise. We're singing from Psalm 95, these six verses. They remind us of the greatness of our God. He's a great king. Uh, remind us of our own situation, verse 6. So we are his sheep, the people of his shepherding, whom his own hand will keep. Psalm 95, 1 to 6, we'll sing his praise. <laughs> Come and let us to the Lord in songs our voices raise. With joyful shouts let us the rock of our salvation praise. To be to with our thanks let us ambrose before his face. figment of his imagination but you are the one true and living God you're the God who made everything with the might and power of your word you spoke into existence this vast universe all out of nothing in the space of six days what a great God you are we acknowledge that you're the great king of all the earth ruling and reigning governing all things for the glory of your name and the good of your people we acknowledge, mighty God, that you're worthy of our worship. And so we come to worship you. We come to bow our heads and our hearts before you, acknowledging the great and only God that you are, the maker of all. We acknowledge too, Lord, that we are your sheep. We're weak, we're vulnerable. Of ourselves, we are prone to wander. But Lord, we bless you for great grace that you become the shepherd of sheep like us. We thank you that you have taken us for your own. And because you've taken us for your own, you'll keep us to the very end. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that all whom Christ saves, he saves to the uttermost. And we thank you that today he has been saving all across this world, gathering in men and women from all the different nations of this, this earth and making them sheep in his flock. We pray that you'd bless us as we come to worship you. We thank you for this day of rest. We thank you for a day to know you and to be known by you. We pray that you'd pardon us our sins, O Lord, even of this day. We pray that we would know day by day the forgiving grace of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that your word will be rich to us, that it'll be food for our souls, that it'll strengthen us in our walk with you. 
We pray for those, Lord, not able to be here this evening. Some engaged in work of mercy and necessity of serving you in other places. We ask, Lord, that you would be with your people wherever they are. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <coughs> well, we read the word of God in a couple of places this evening in John chapter 10, first of all. John chapter 10, these opening 21 verses we're going to read and then jump into the prophecy of Ezekiel to read a, a little there in the opening, chap, opening uh, verses of chapter 34. First of all, this evening in John 10 and next Lord's Day, if we're spared, uh, Lord's Supper will be celebrated here and we'll be thinking then uh, again of this passage and we want to begin uh, pondering it this evening. John 10 and verse 1, we hear God's word. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. It isn't seeing. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And then reading in prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 34. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel. Who have been feeding yourselves? Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the, with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you've not strengthened, the sick you've not healed, the injured you've not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd. And they came, became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God. Surely because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, 
And because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mice, that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on the days of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing. And in rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Well, before we come to look at our passage this evening, we're going to sing, turning to Psalm 80. It's another one of the Psalms that has the motif of sheep and shepherds. O shepherd of all Israel, give ear. You like a flock of sheep leads Joseph on and thrown between the cherubim shine forth to Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, show strength, come save. O God, us now restore, we will be saved. May your face shine once more. We're singing the large verses 1 and 2 and 6. We praise God together. O shepherd of
Lord, as we've sung in our prayers, we acknowledge that you've been the shepherd of your people through the ages. You shepherded your people throughout the Old Testament, preserving the line for Messiah. You've shepherded your people ever since her expansion to the ends of the earth in gathering the Gentiles. You've watched over them all, every part of your body, every tribe within her. You've been the, sh the shepherd of your sheep. Lord, we look out at the church today and don't have to look very far beyond ourselves to see how weak your bride is, how lacking in strength your church is. And Lord, we cry the prayer of the psalmist. Lord, revive us once more. Lord, as your people cried in the Old Testament, where we have erred that you would show us that we might live lives of repentance, that we might know your hand of blessing. We thank you that your hand has been on the man of your right hand, the God-man Jesus Christ, the one you, whom you strengthened to finish his course and to lay down his life a ransom for many. We thank you that because of him there is grace and mercy, there's reviving and revival for the people of God. And so we say, Lord God of hosts, once more again restore. Strengthen us in our walk. Strengthen us as we come to look at this well-known passage of your word, that we might see the shepherd whom you've provided to rescue, restore, and redeem all of his own. Hear our prayer, Lord, and bless your word to our heart as you see our need. For Christ's sake, amen. <clears throat> well, please open up your Bible in John chapter 10. We're not going to be working our way systematically through this uh, section of John 10 tonight and next week, but... As we come to this perhaps most well-known chapter of the Bible, we'll be thinking of the central theme of this chapter, highlighted there in two key texts, in verse 11 and in verse 14, where the Lord makes this great self-declaration, I am the good shepherd. And there's something about those words, isn't there? The good shepherd. Something warm. There's something reviving. There's something wooing and consoling. This is how our Saviour describes himself for his people. I am the good shepherd. Or more literally, it actually reads, I am the shepherd, the good one. And that is an important emphasis that the Lord Jesus was making then and now. I am the shepherd the good one. And in the language that the Lord chose for the New Testament scriptures to be written in, the Greek language, when, when John is recording what the Lord Jesus said, obviously he, uh, John's writing it in Greek, Jesus would have said it in, in Aramaic, but was, John was guided to record it in the Greek language. Uh, at that time, there were at least two different words for good uh, and you'll know both of them actually, they come across into our English language. Uh, one of the, the words for good is, uh, uh, we get the name, the, the, it's not used very much, but the, the woman's name, Agatha, from. Uh, and the word means moral goodness. Um, so different words in Greek for good, that's one of them. We get the word Agatha from and it means moral goodness. So I could sing you a song uh, just now, I'm not going to obviously, and, and I hope it would be good in that sense, it would be morally good, to be nothing rude in it or vulgar, I would assure you, but at another level, it wouldn't be very good, it wouldn't be very tuneful, and it wouldn't be very musical. Uh, so in the Greek language, uh, if you wanted to say something was not only good morally, but good aesthetically, lovely and beautiful, 
They use another word, and it was the word kalos. If you like calligraphy, beautiful writing, it literally means, it comes from this word. It means beautiful, noble, honourable. And that's the self-declaration that the Lord makes about himself. I am the shepherd, the excellent, the beautiful, the outstanding shepherd of his people. Well, of course, when the Lord says he's the good shepherd, we are reminded that we're sheep. That's a little less beautiful, isn't it? We're prone to wander. We're easily spooked. We're vulnerable and we're weak. Isaiah tells us that all, that all we like sheep have gone astray. That's you and me by nature. Even rescued sheep have this ability to wander. So we thank God that we have a shepherd, the good one. So let's think of him a little bit this evening and God willing, if we're spared to return next week, we'd be thinking again on this theme. I'm not telling you anything new this evening. You, you know these truths. But as the Apostle Peter writes, I will put you in remembrance of them. So as we think of this good, excellent, honourable uh, Saviour Shepherd, let's remind ourselves that he knows his sheep. He knows his sheep. At you. And in this self uh, declaration of the Lord, when he writes that he is the shepherd, the good one, he was distinguishing himself from the bad ones that are hinted at there in verse 8. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. So he's different, he's not like them. He's in a, a line of his, of his own. Um, as I said in the singing, the, the, the picture of shepherd, it's, it's not a new, new Testament image. It's got long Old Testament roots. Uh, in fact, at the very time when the Lord Jesus was saying these wonderful words, uh, I didn't read on to verse 22, but if you're following at your Bible, uh, you will see, at, it says there in verse 22, at that time the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. Uh, the feast of dedication, it wasn't a, uh, a God-given feast. It wasn't God had, hadn't told them to celebrate night, like the Passover or Tabernacles, uh, Feast of Tabernacles. This was one that the Jews had, had uh, put together themselves. It was to celebrate a a great uh, uh, victory in their history. You might have heard of uh, uh, Judas Maccabus. Um, he was Jew in the second century BC, and he he led a group of uh, of uh, uh, soldiers up against uh, one of the armed armies that were coming against them with the Seleucids at that time in the second century BC. One particular infamous one on tack is Epiphanes IV and uh, Judas uh, Maccabees. He, he rescued the people and so they set up this festival, the Feast of, of Dedication in honour of that great victory. Jews celebrate it today. You'll have heard Jews or in the news even or on television, the, the, the Hanukkah uh, festival and that's when Jesus Christ was making this statement. And every time they celebrated the Feast of Dedication, uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 34 was read. Uh, obviously they were saying that Judas Maccabees was not like the bad shepherds. He was, a, he was a good shepherd. Well, that was the moment where the Lord Jesus made this great self-declaration when the words of Ezekiel 34, we read some of them, would have been ringing in the ears of the people. And he was saying, I'm different. I am the shepherd, the good one. I'm not like all the bad shepherds. Uh, if you look at uh, Ezekiel 34 and, and verse 15 in your order of service, I have it there. For the Lord made this promise, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares 
the Lord God. And the Lord Jesus, he was saying now, this great promise is being fulfilled in me. This is what's happening. The promised divine shepherd had come. And he was no thief. And he was no robber. Uh, the shepherds that God's people had had throughout their history were just like that. They were self-satisfying. They were self-advancing. They robbed the people. They stole from them. And the, and the people knew that when the Lord Jesus used these words, I am the shepherd, the good one, that he was pointing his finger at the Pharisees, the scribes, the elders, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, people who'd, these shepherds who'd prayed, who'd used and abused the flock of God. These false shepherds had never lifted a finger to help. So that this morning, even in passing in our passage, where the Lord goes beyond Galilee into Judea, where there were lots of Jews. The Pharisees never lifted a finger to help. All they did was add a burden. Verse 10, the Lord says they came to steal and, and kill and destroy. They knew nothing about their sheep, about the sheep because they cared nothing. But the Lord Jesus, he came to give life. He came to, to build. He came to redeem and he knows his sheep it's a lovely picture at the start of this uh, passage uh, this evening verses 1 to 6 the Lord is just simply painting this wonderful uh, scene out in the countryside he's got a message he, he doesn't initially speak into it about what's what in the picture verses 1 to 6 there um, but it's a beautiful picture well, that's a picture too stating his wonderful knowledge of his sheep. He calls his own by name. And in verse 14 he says, makes it abundantly clear, I am the good shepherd, I know my own. And in verse uh, 27, away beyond uh, what we read, he says there, my sheep hear my voice and I know them now do you think about that for yourself here's this shepherd the good one beautiful excellent one one full of moral goodness perfect and righteous one is excellent in all he does and he knows his sheep and if you look at verse 15, you get some sort of idea of the depth and the intensity of this knowledge he says in verse 15, Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And that goes on the back of what he has said in verse 14, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Well, well think of that. Well, we can't even begin to think about it, actually. He says his knowledge of his sheep is as deep and intimate as the knowledge that the Father has of the Son and the Son has of the Father. Well, what sort of knowledge is that? What sort of knowledge does God the Father have of his only begotten Son who has been at his side from all eternity? What sort of knowledge does the, the Son have of his glorious Father? Well, it's perfect. In every single dimension and beyond our ability to grasp. And, and the Lord Jesus is stressing the deep intensity of how he knows his sheep. So you and I are to think about that. He, he knows us in the deepest, intensest, intimate way imaginable. He knows your name. Knows your background. Knows all of the things that you've been through and will go through. You're not a statistic to him. You're not a number. He knows his sheep. Everything about you. He knows you perfectly. He knows his sheep individually. He knows them collectively. He knows every little last detail about us. 
the things that we don't know about ourselves or understand. He knows perfectly. He knows all your hurts. He knows all your fears. He knows all your frustrations. He knows all our feelings. He knows all our stumblings. He knows about all your tears. He knows about all your desires. He knows about all the things you can't quite understand or get your head round. He knows all your frustrations and all your heartache. He says, I know my sheep. I'm not like the bad shepherds. I know my sheep. And isn't it wonderful what he says? He says, I know my sheep. We're bought by his precious blood. He views us as his treasured possession. And he says, I know my sheep. So take comfort in that, Christian. George Whitfield, great preacher of past centuries, says of this, what a mercy it is that he does know us. Thomas Manton, preacher from further back from Whitfield said and listen to this Christ has a particular knowledge of all the elect who they are where they are what they are and here it comes he takes special notice of them that he may suitably apply himself to them so he knows you perfectly so that he might apply himself to you, to every one of his sheep, how he knows we need him in our lives. He knows his sheep. He's like a shepherd going out across the fields, and he knows every single sheep, all that's wrong with every one of them. And he knows exactly what the sheep need. And your needs may be different from the sheep beside you. But he knows exactly what you need. He knows his sheep. He knows the little gatherings of his sheep. And all their struggles and all their frustrations. We've been seeing it in our midweek meeting going through the book of Revelation. So I've seen it a number of times recently, how the Lord Jesus, risen and glorious in heaven, he says, I know, I know, I know. And here's the shepherd saying, I know, because I know my sheep. And you'll have to suck the honey out of that for yourself. About what exactly it is that thrills your heart that he knows about you. Secondly, he leads his sheep. He leads his sheep. Israel, as I said, had many bad shepherds in the past and in the present at that moment when Jesus was speaking to them. And they were all poor leaders. In uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, 34 and verse 4, the Lord spoke and rebuked them. The weak you've not strengthened. The sick you've not healed. The injured you've not bound up. The strayed you've not brought back. The lost you've not sought. And with force and harshness you've ruled them. That's how those Old Testament bad shepherds worked. How the Pharisees worked. They dealt brutally and harshly with the sheep. And the sheep were spooked. Verse 5 of chapter four, th uh, 34, we saw, So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. Scattered and leaderless. leaderless. Remember when Ezekiel was writing this, he's writing from Babylon. Sheep have been scattered. How were they scattered? Because the false shepherds had not brought the word of God. Do you remember what Jeremiah said? That there'll be those who'll be going around and saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace 
Oh, you'll stay in the land. Don't worry about that. Just, just get on with life. Didn't listen to God. The shepherds were not leading the flock. They were scattered as they walked from God. How different with respect to the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. Saw it this morning, but his compassion for people. Saw it previously in Matthew 9 and 36 then. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The Pharisees of that time, they weren't interested in being loving, leading shepherds. But here comes the Lord Jesus Christ and he gently leads his sheep. Look at this picture that he begins this uh, great sermon on or this great, these great sayings on and at the opening part of this 10th chapter. You picture the scene, scene here. He, it says in verse 4, when he's brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. It's a, it's a picture of just what everyone would have been known about in that time, that there was this great communal fold where all the shepherds brought their sheep into at night. And the morning came, they just stood at the entrance to the sheepfold and they, they called out their sheep and the sheep just followed along after them. Told in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. It's a very different picture from shepherding today. You've seen it in television or in real life. It's a man and his dogs and his whistle and his shouting and maybe he's on a, on a quad bike tooting the horn, shooing the sheep along in front of him. But in Bible times, it was the complete opposite. It was a tranquil, calm scene of the shepherd going in front and the sheep following. And the Lord Jesus, he picks up that image and he says, that's how it is with me and my sheep. I lead them and they follow. The Lord Jesus leads his sheep. We sing it in our great psalm. He leads us beside quiet waters. He guides by paths of righteousness. He, he leads his sheep. So, Think of all his dealings with you in your life. Hasn't he led you to, to see him? For some, he led you in his providence to be set in a home where you knew the scriptures from infancy and the spirit of God worked and awakened. For others, he came into your life leading you to hear the sound of the gospel and to trust in Jesus Christ. He, he, he leads all his sheep into a personal knowledge of himself as he gives them life. And if you think of your life, whatever stage of life that you're at, it's true for every one of Christ's sheep. He, he's been before us in the path of life. He's been leading us every step. Is that your testimony? When you were weak and wandering, didn't you find him, the, the shepherd who, who, who led you back? When we were frightened and worried, didn't we find him the shepherd who was carrying us on his back? Hasn't it been your experience that Lord's Day by Lord's Day you came to worship and you heard his voice? Sometimes it was a correcting voice. Sometimes it was a comforting voice. And always a counselling wise voice. Oh, what a shepherd! He is, the, he is the good one. He's leading his sheep. You see, the Christian life is so very simple. He's leading his sheep on the path to heaven. That's your life. You're just like a, like a little sheep coming behind this good shepherd. And he's taking you on the path to heaven. He knows exactly the right path to lead you on. You wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. But he knows exactly. He knows his sheep, doesn't he? So he knows exactly the path that you and I will need. That's what Romans chapter 8 actually is all about. When it talks about God working all things together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. That whole passage is saying that, that God in the working of his spirit... 
the spirit of this good shepherd. He's praying into place all the little features of our lives. That'll be the perfect path to get the sheep home to the heavenly sheepfolds. He leads his sheep. And because he's leading his sheep, just as he led the people of Israel through the wilderness and the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, he's always before us. You and I think in our lives that we're, we're just heading out in this path and this is virgin territory. It's not. He's cut the path before us and he's before us in that path because he leads his sheep. God willing, if we're spared next Lord's Day, we'll be back with the Lord's table set before us. And every path that you and I have been on since we last were at the table, it's been a path that he's been in front, leading his sheep. So sheep in the flock, you can persevere in the path because the path in which you're not on your own he goes before you. He's out front. And his sheep are always listening for his voice. So listen. Listen. He knows his sheep. And he leads his sheep. And then thirdly, in this beautiful picture, he feeds his sheep. And again, this was a stark contrast with the bad shepherds of Israel at that time and in the past. Oh, they were shepherds who fed, but they weren't feeding the flock. They were stuffing themselves. In Ezekiel 34 and verse 2, we read there, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? And the Lord Jesus is saying, Now, I'm the shepherd, the good one. These men were parasites. They were feeding off the sheep. It's the same with every false shepherd. Very relevant picture this of the Lord Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the shepherd, the good one. We live in a world where we are surrounded by shepherds, people calling to us from all walks and avenues of life, so all sorts of philosoph philosophies, come follow me. And they're all like the bad shepherds of the scriptures. They're feeding off men and women. You think of the philosophy that just echoes out in, in modern day culture, be it in, on, on films, be it in, in, in books, be it in, in songs. There are all these voices, oh, this is the life you want, follow me. And are they wanting to feed the sheep? No, they're wanting to feed themselves. They're wanting to feed off the sheep. But the Lord had promised that he would send a different shepherd. In Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 14 again, the Lord says, I will feed them with good pastures. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. They shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pastures they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be their shepherd. And that's what the Lord Jesus is now saying here. in John chapter 10 and verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and he'll go in and out and find pasture. See what he's saying again? I'm the long promised good shepherd. One that we've sung of since we were able to sing in Psalm 23. The one who leads me to lie down in green pastures. So he, he, he feeds his sheep. When, he, when, when the good shepherd knows his sheep and leads his sheep, he never leads us to barrenness. So every path that he's leading us along in our lives is to help us feed and to grow in our love for him 
who first loved us. It's a great principle when we're having to make choices in life, career, person to spend our lives with. Will this help me to feed on Jesus Christ? Because his desire is to feed his sheep. It's why the Lord Jesus Christ has given his church. One of, his purpose, one, of, one of the purposes of his church is that she would be a little piece of pasture. It's a strange picture to think in the middle of Belfast. But 411 Woodstock Road is a little bit of green pasture for sheep. And we ought to pray that God will bring sheep needing to be fed. How the devil does mischief. He does mischief when there's trouble in the church. And he'll do everything he can to keep the sheep from feeding. On the Lord's day, if we're spared, he's going to come to feed us again. Feed us with his word. Feed us with the sacrament that we might be strengthened in feasting on Jesus Christ. Week by week, he comes to feed us. Well, I don't know how you view yourself. But we don't need to be like the world struggling for identity. Who am I? Christian knows. I know exactly who I am. I am a prized sheep belonging to Jesus Christ whom he knows perfectly, whom he's leading home to his heavenly folds, and he's promised to feed me and care for me along the way. He knows his sheep. He leads his sheep. And he feeds them. His sheep hear his voice. Oh, what a saviour. John Piper, commenting in this passage, speaks of our saviour, ready to abandon his life that we would have abundant life. That's the sort of saviour shepherd he is. Oh, he is indeed the shepherd, the good one. Amen. Well, we sing of him in our psalm, the A setting of Psalm 23. You can think of what these words mean for your life as we sing them. And as we think, we sing them, we not only think of what they mean for our lives, we think of what they must have meant for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who walked perfectly with his heavenly Father and followed, the one who abandoned his life that we would have abundant life. Psalm 23a, we sing his praise.
you that your son, our shepherd, knows us. And that day by day, he's leading us. And we rejoice in his feeding of us. For if it were not for him feeding us, we would be weak and wandering. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your shepherdly care. Thank you that you know these sheep here tonight. That you know this little part of your fools. And thank you that you've promised to lead us and to feed us and to keep us. We pray that we might rest in this picture of who you are and re might rejoice in the identity that we have in Jesus Christ, known, led, fed sheep. We pray that these truths would go with us out into the world this week, a world where none have a shepherd to watch over them, where people are broken and wandering, and we pray for opportunity to tell them of the shepherd, the good one, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen.